Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right. <coughs> we will call the meeting, the, uh, meeting to order for your for West Dakota Water Development District, our August meeting. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Our little flag over there. Didn't bring the big one, so. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please stand, please stand for the invitation. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for a fairly safe rally. Hope that everybody gets home safe to their designated homes or next travel destination, and that the rain and sewer issues can subside long enough for work to be done on them. Amen. Thank you. Uh, before we do uh, the roll call, uh, I think uh, most people here are probably aware of uh, Steve Rollinger's uh, situation. It was uh, the day after our last meeting in July that uh, Steve had a heart attack the very next day, went into the hospital. They had to put a stent in. He, he had a heart blockage, so they put a stent in, and he had a couple of other ones that were partially uh, blocked. And then they sent him home, this was on Wednesday, they sent him home on Saturday, and he was home for six hours and had a massive stroke. And so he's been, he was in intensive care in regional, and now he's in the rehab part of regional up above uh, Ruby Tuesdays there. And, uh, Dan and I were over there this morning visiting. He's, he's, coming, he's coming along, he's paralyzed, or partially paralyzed on his left side. But he's making progress. He's in rehab, and, and uh, he was asking about the meeting tonight, so he's he's coming back. But uh, that's why there's only eight of us here. So anyway, uh, we could have the roll call, please. Okay, roll call. Coat? Yes. Yerke? Here. Frisco? Here. Jobic? Here. Rollinger? Williams? Here. Mack? Here. Violata? Here. Harris? Here. We have a quorum. Eight present. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next item is the approval of the agenda. Uh, I'd like to have a couple items uh, added to the agenda. We have uh, Catherine, Kathleen uh, Christofferson here to accept the uh, Gail Holbrook Award on behalf of Dr. Lizenby. And then also Jay Gilberson is here from the East Dakota Water Development District and is going to give an update or give us some information on the program he's been working with DENR. So if we could add, uh, I thought we'd bring those in uh, under, after we approve the minutes under 6, maybe 6A and 6B. That way they can, if they want to leave, they can depart. Any other changes to the agenda? James. 6AB slash 2. Um, just have Jay briefly talk about the lawsuit regarding the PFAS phone. He brought, Jay, Jay yep, yeah, he brought us some information, just so it's on the record that okay. he's fine. We're going to be out of here by 10. Yeah, sure. Okay, 6C. 6A, B, and C. Okay, so... When you get done with your first one, just continue with the second one, Jay. Any other changes to the agenda? If not, uh, we'll have a motion. To move to approve as amended. Second. Moved and seconded to approve the agenda as amended. Any discussion? All in favor of the motion indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carried. Uh, next item, conflict of interest. Has everyone's had a chance to look at the agenda? Are there any items on the agenda that would be a conflict uh, of interest of any of the board members? James? Yeah, number eight, even though we're not voting on it. Just so everybody's aware. Okay, so noted. Anything else? I'll point out, you know, I'm still a USGS employee of sorts. USGS budget items are on the budget we'll approve. Um, I don't consider it a, a conflict to vote on the budget end of things, but if anybody thought it would be a conflict, I, you know, we could certainly put it up for discussion. Okay. Anybody else? All right, so noted. 
the next item is the approval of the minutes from the previous meeting. Is there a motion to approve? Move to approve. Move to approve by Dan Driscoll. Is there a second? I'll second. Second by Linda. Discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of approval of the minutes from the previous meeting, indicate by saying aye. 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 Both the same sign, motion carried. So that moves us to uh, item 6. 6A, I guess, would be. Uh, Kathleen is here. Uh, we, do, we do have an uh, award for you it's called the Gale Brook, Whole Book Award. And I would be glad to present it to you. Linda Harris did a lot of work on it. You just come up here. So on behalf of the, the board of directors, let's go to the Water Development District. We'd like to present you this award. We'd like to invite you to receive it. I appreciate it greatly. I, yeah. I know this yeah. group was, yeah. the work you do was very important to Elvis, and I know he did a lot working with this group over several years. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this means a lot to me, and I really appreciate it. Well, we certainly appreciate all we did for not only this project, our board, but for the whole area. Thank you. Get it, oh. Okay. Oh. 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 Yeah. Oh. He wants to get a picture of us. No. Oh. No. Okay. Add it to the grade. Nathan's idea. That's a good idea. Where do you want? Back here? Up against the top. You want to get it? Again. Also. We'll have redundancy here. Who? <laughs> <laughs> what is her relationship after this meeting? She's from college. What's her relationship after this meeting? Thought it was his wife. here and uh, he sent me an email he's gone up here today meeting with the staff on the item of rotating basins water sampling program so he's going to FYI some information for us on that is that right Jay? That would be my intent All sure. right. so you have the floor alright could I could you kind of stand there sure I was going to stand over here just so I was and identify yourself totally sure. okay yeah uh, Jay Gelbertson, I'm the manager of the East Dakota Water Development District, San Diego's other side of the state. And uh, as Daniel pointed out, I, I, I do travel quite a bit, and as Dan said, I was here today. So as far as I'm concerned, this is in the neighborhood, so if I <laughs> pop over, it's not an issue. Close enough. <clears throat> it's close enough. Um, yeah, I just wanted to share, I know, uh, of course, I was out here a couple of months ago and, 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 and sat in on the sort of the listening session that, that you folks had to look at, at potential activities down the road and know that was a discussion at last month's meeting and thought that uh, this uh, what what we what we're calling the rotating basins project might be something of interest to the board uh, down the line uh, primarily because uh, it addresses what I heard to be the most common sort of query last time around was simply uh, a desire to know more about water quality uh, in the Black Hills you know, West Dakota and particular, but the Black Hills in general. A um, little bit of background, the state uh, maintains uh, several sets of monitoring networks. Uh, there's a groundwater quality monitoring network that uh, uh, is scattered across shallow aquifers uh, all across the state, uh, primarily in the eastern side where we use those for water supplies more often than, say, deep aquifers like the Madison up here. Um, it's tested on a regular basis. Uh, the water that's managed by the State Geological Survey Program, uh, Water Rights Program, 
uh, monitors water level in about 1,600 observation wells scattered across the state from everything to deep crystalline holes to shallow uh, sand and gravel aquifers to keep tabs on just how much water is available uh, for use and if too much is being used and so forth. Uh, and then finally, there is a surface water quality network um, called the WQ, Water Quality Monitoring Network. We need to work on it. Okay, coming up with better names. <laughs> so water, what is it? It's the Water Quality Monitoring Network, it's WQM set. Um, there are about 153 WQM sites scattered across the state. Some of them are sort of just uniformly spaced along major tributaries. Others are uh, will bracket things like major uh, point source dischargers. I suspect there's a WQM site immediately upstream and then another one not too far downstream of the walk of the Rapid City's wastewater treatment plant, just to keep tabs on what's going on. Um, all of those are tested on a regular basis. The WQM network um, samples are collected either monthly or quarterly, depending on where you are and what the resource is, what the concerns are. Uh, and that forms the foundation for a lot of what the state does in terms of determining impairments to water bodies. If the data suggests or starts to point toward there being a problem, chances are pretty good that initial idea came out of the WQM network. Uh, now, unfortunately, because they're not out there on a very frequent basis or more frequent basis, there usually needs to be a follow-up assessment study. Uh, back 20 years ago, we were just getting started on what was called the Central Big Sioux Watershed Assessment. We took a chunk of the Big Sioux River, which we knew had some issues, and instituted a very intense uh, monitoring program. It was the, the second of what would be four uh, studies up and down the Big Sioux River Basin that culminated in 2003. However, there's, since then, there's been no follow-up effort by the state. Their model is just to go out, study it, identify the problems, and then start making corrective measures. Now, what they've determined over the years is that, well, it saves a little bit of money on water quality sampling and monitoring. It doesn't always give a very good picture. You don't necessarily know whether or not Rapid Creek got better, or the Big Sioux River got better, or the James River got better, if you don't go back and retest it after you've done all the things that you think are going to make it better. And um, which leads us to the Rotating Basin Project. About six years ago, East Dakota, we at East Dakota started doing a very uh, intense monitoring program on the Big Sioux River on our own, in addition to what the state was doing. We wanted to know whether the money we were investing in other activities was making a difference. Recognizing the state only had so much in the way of resources, we started to invest our own activity. And what, one of the things that came out of that was a much better understanding of the condition of the resource. In some instances, impairments that had been identified with additional information, we were able to establish that they weren't really a problem. They had been identified because there was a limited data set. And with more information, it found out that the five bad samples that were driving the impairment were the only five bad samples ever. Uh, and so by getting a bunch more, we were able to take care of it. And so. Um, recognizing that there have been issues and, and people want to know what their water's like. Um, about a year ago, we started kicking around the idea of um, getting into a regular rotation of doing assessment level studies of the major water bodies, surface water bodies, lakes, rivers, and streams in South Dakota on a regular basis. The current plan divides this, will divide the state up into five chunks although at this point we don't necessarily know what the other four chunks look like. The first chunk is the Big Sioux River Basin, the Minnesota River, and the Red River of the North watershed. Basically everything along or east of Interstate 29 over on the eastern edge, which just happens to coincide very nicely with the, with the work that we were already doing and had people and staff ready to go. We're currently looking at 42 surface rivers and stream sites uh, in that area and uh, collecting samples from 22 lakes out of their, uh, a planned 40. 2019 is, is uh, the pilot year, and nobody's ever done more than about three or four lakes at a time. In 
in a study. We thought ramping up from three or four to 22 was going to be enough, and 40 is going to be really entertaining and interesting. But um, uh, what's involved in the lakes work uh, under the state's current activities, they will get out to a select number of lakes twice a year um, for over a two-year period, and then it goes back into a, a hopper of randomly drawn water bodies, and it may or may not ever come back. Um, as mentioned with the surface of the streams, rivers and streams, the work is monthly at best and quarterly in many cases. Uh, for the rotating basin study, we're doing uh, monthly lake sampling, uh, May, June, July, August, September, and October. Uh, for the rivers and streams, we're doing twice a month sampling, um, again, May, June, May through October over the recreational season. So we're going to end up with a considerably bigger data set. Um, Again, yeah, this 2019 is the pilot, 2020 and 21. 2021 will be the Big Sioux, well, segment one. Segments two, three, and four, or yeah, two, three, four, and five will follow, and then ideally starting again in 2030, we'll be back in and doing the same thing all over again at the Big Sioux River Basin to really see what's going on. That level of assessment outside of the work that we hasn't been, isn't being repeated anywhere else in the state. And the state's figured out that that's probably a, that would be a good thing to do. Now, because it's helping, it's, it's going to be a huge boon to the state's efforts, they are providing a considerable amount of the resources. Um, because we've already got a huge network of, of, of stations and bodies in place, we've been able to cost share a lot of the current, the first phase, because we're already doing stuff. We have guys who are going to go out and take samples anyway, so we might as, that, that's our contribution. We're not really, it's not saving us any money that way. Um, we're still looking at, for a slightly reduced thing, about $115,000 just for this year. We're expecting to probably try and squirrel away the better part of $200,000 to $225,000 for next year to cover the 82 monitoring sites and all the work that needs to be done. Uh, and then looking ahead past that, past Big Sioux to when another entity or local partner would ideally be identified that could help out. And if they don't have a staff as we do, they're going to have to get paid. So we're having, we're keeping track of all our contributed time just so when they go somewhere else where there's nobody there, there's an idea. Now, where those next four segments are going to be is hard to say. Uh, Big Sioux and, and the Minnesota and the red are, you know, it does go border to border. Most of it's in a little <coughs> tighter area, and we're already doing that kind of thing anyway. In the, you look at the James River as the next possible target. That also goes border to border, but there's no infrastructure in place. Um, where does the Vermilion fit in? What do you do with the West River, rivers and lake-ish sort of things? The Black Hills are, frankly, a potential <coughs> phase two target, just because it's a more constrained area and it'll be easier to try the not East Dakota version here in the hills. Um, as I said, the state is providing a considerable amount of support to us right now with anticipation of that growing, or they recognize that you know once we're no longer involved, that's going to be something they're going to have to come up with. And it might be something long way around, um, as you folks are looking at activities and things to do or things to be involved with related to water quality, this is an opportunity working with the state potentially to gather a tremendous amount of water quality data about the rivers and streams, reservoirs, I hate to call them lakes uh, here within uh, the West Dakota area, um, and also in surrounding areas. Now, we go outside of East Dakota to do work. When we do, the state reimburses us for a portion of, the, of that work involved, recognizing that our tax base isn't necessarily interested in supporting water quality sampling or footing the whole bill for water quality sampling in Roberts County to the north, which is part of East Dakota. And I would think a similar sort of situation could be arranged here. Um, you know, we'll have, we're going to need to find somebody or somebody's involved with this and, and 
this is one that comes with um, certainly a, a potential contribution at the local level, but funding, an external funding source that isn't going to require everybody to step up and write news checks. The state recognizes that this data is going to be pretty important stuff. So. What, what resources is DENR? You said they're providing resources. What, what are they providing? Money? Cash. cash. Okay, cash. Yeah. We, again, um, because we were already doing almost everything of the river and stream sites, we've, the area that we were already covering encompasses 41 of the 42 monitoring sites they wanted looked at. The one outlier is a sampling site up near Browns Valley, Hortonville, or up the Sisson area, which is a 20 minute excursion outside of the area. And so we were, we had everything there already and going in place. So we're basically there, they are paying for all the analytical costs, which has been a huge savings for us. Um, our staff time was already going to be invested in this type of activity, so it's an easy contribution for us. And we're getting reimbursed on some of the travel and some of the other miscellaneous expense costs. So your staff is, is collecting the data? Our the, staff is collecting the and data. The, and then the lab's doing the... We're sending all the samples are going to the state health lab in Pier. Oh, okay. And that presents some logistical problems from time to time. Mm -hmm. you know, um, particularly if you're looking at things like bacteria because they have holding, very stringent holding requirements if you collect a bacteria sample right now at 622, it's got to be in the lab within 24 hours. Otherwise, the sample's no good. Sure. And so we have our, our routes are set up to always make sure we're back at a place we can get the samples sent overnight. We're discovering that there are invasive, aquatic invasive species in some of these water bodies that have rerouted some of our sampling protocols. One of the lakes has Eurasian milfoil, or no, curly leaf pondweed which, so that is the last link that one of the two boats we have goes to each month and then the boat sits outside in the sunshine for a couple of weeks so it dries up and it's not a problem. And we've had to reroute one of our river sampling runs to avoid, so that we go downstream because there are zebra mussels in the Missouri River. And normally we would take a sample at the far southern end of the Big Sioux and then work our way north. Well, if we're sampling at North Sioux City and there's a zebra mussel, our gear could theoretically pick it up and carry it 30 miles north to the next monitoring site. So now we start at the upstream end and at North Sioux City and then again everything goes through a decontamination process. It's been an interesting, it's been an interesting learning curve, but it's kind of fun. Interesting. It looks like you have some questions. Okay. Does DENR have requirements or recommendations on your sampling procedures? Right, we're following, we're following state protocol uh, on all of this. So that is why your data then will be acceptable right. to them. And, yeah. and, and what it's going toward really is it's filling a lot of gaps in the, the uh, biennial uh, integrated report, the list of water bodies in your condition every year. Um, they're just, a, they're, there were more and more instances where the we don't know was the answer, and, and that's on it. You know, I'm not as familiar with water bodies up here, but I'm going to guess that, you know, there's some pond off in the middle of nowhere that nobody goes to, and you ask, you know, what is, what's that water like? And you say, we don't know. That's, to the guy that lives there, it's disappointing, but everybody else is no good. If you ask, well, what's the water like in Pactola? And the answer is, we don't know. That's a completely unacceptable response. Same with Ponser and Pesky Pelican. So we're having to, to ramp everything up. At this point, they don't have the additional staff, but we've been able to identify additional funding through the through the state and some of the grant programs that are going to help build this capacity or build the program and with it, some local capacity to cooperate. All right, so, do you have a question? I, <laughs> I know in the protocol, but he did it. So <laughs> you are a director, I get that. But, wow. um, who decides the sampling sites and how often you're going to sample? Is that you guys? Um, the, the first time around, the, the state came up, I mean, they looked at it and said, well, you know, we're only, if, we, if, if the state goes to a lake now, it's maybe twice a year. They wanted more, monthly. Okay, so we're going to do five months, five or six months. Um, the 
twice a month is at least doubling what the WPM monitoring is doing and, and, and you know, tripling or, or whatever uh, in other instances. The sites themselves, a lot of them are sites that have been part of previous investigations or are part of their current network. I'll be honest, in, in our case, yeah, we picked a lot of the sites, um, partly by, by having selected them years ago as part of the assessment activity. Um, some of the places they had wanted us to target, we moved. Or they, we suggested they consider an alternate choice for cause, and, and they were willing to do that. Um, you know, and for somebody from here to drive all the way to Brandon to take a sample is a lot of work. You know, for somebody in my shop who's already in Brandon to take a sample is a piece of cake. So, but we were we were involved in some of the site selection. Um, the root of it is identifying spots that will provide data to augment and better complete data grid report. So some of that's already there. I probably just <clears throat> missed it early on, but what shop is this in? Part of the water quality? This is the watershed protection program. We're coming running through there. And we're using a, a mix this year. It's a mix of 604B and I think 106 funding that they have through their program. We'll be looking at probably adding some 319 funding to that, as well as uh, potentially some options, along with a big chunk from us. Robert, my question is about the what are what exactly is the sampling that you're taking? Is it all biological? Is it no? It's uh, chemistry. Um, sure. I was going to open this thing up. I have I have I have a copy of the of the agreement we're currently working off of. Um, we're doing air temp at each site, air temperature, water temperature, discharge if it's a stream, uh, depth, visual observations, you know, rainy, that sort of thing. Um, water levels, if that's appropriate, uh, specific conductivity, field pH, uh, dissolved oxygen is measured. Um, Samples are collected for chemical tests of total solids, total suspended solids, total dissolved solids, uh, ammonia, unionized, unionized ammonia, nitrate, uh, nitrite as nitrogen, total Keldahl nitrogen, total phosphate, and total dissolved phosphorus. And then we're doing E. coli bacterial tests, and then in the lake samples, we're collecting chlorophyll A samples, which are then, and the, the field work. The physical sampling is done in the field um, by my staff. All the chemical tests, along with the, the E. coli, are sent to the state health lab in Pier. The chlorophyll A samples are done by the little gnomes in the lab at the Foster with the DNR. Do you know about an average cost per sample in a clear program? I should. That's I think I made it all up here. Um, $160 a sample? $160? Yeah, that was that that's the number we're working off of. Okay. Is that lab only? Pardon? That's the lab sampling only. That, okay, that's the lab yeah. Okay. Yeah. And there's I mean there's gear and equipment. We had a boat, a small one. We need a much bigger boat to go out on Lake Ponset when the wind is blowing. <laughs> I mean, next year we're going to be on Big Stone and Lake Traverse, and I'm not sure that our boat's big enough for those two guys. <laughs> but uh, and at times we've got both boats out in the water to get the samples at the time. Um, so, but anyway, it's an interesting. Yeah. Probably. Do you have a? Is there a mechanism for sampling like we might do here? Uh, if we sample various parts of the class. Well, that, I mean, that that's part of why this is here. I mean, I know there's been interest in doing this, you know, kind of ebbs and flows over the years. Um, you know, the, the whatever, whether it's phase two, three, four, or five, it, it's likely to be the whole of the Black Hills, but it would be a, a mechanism by which a lot of the sampling could get paid for within the West Dakota footprint um, by the state as part of their efforts. Uh, and perhaps provide an opportunity, if, you know, to, to develop some local infrastructure, some local staff, or you know, provide Dan with some training on how to do this. Something for, you know, that he could do or 
some other staff, some arrangement would be done. Are there any plans to look at uh, some sort of a mobile sampling testing facility that you could just drive to the location? No. Sample out? The, the samples need to go to the, I mean, we, we've got the capability to do some field sampling. The dissolved, some of the dissolved oxygen and the conductivity, those are done with meters in the field. Um, for some of this stuff, it ends up being, it could theoretically end up being um, part of enforcement actions or compliance actions if, if you know, you're running, unless you can get a mobile lab that can give you lab equivalent results, I mean, certified lab equivalent results, someone is going to say, Ron's going to say, hey, yeah, that's great, but that's just, you know, Jay with his little dipstick thing over here, that's not, a, that's not, this, this result is not the same as had the lab, had the sample been sent to a real lab. And so, samples are going to real labs. Now here that could include... Mid-continent. Mid-continent, which is an option. We've actually had a couple of projects where we've sent samples into Minnesota. Because in the far northeastern part of around Orkinville and Millbank, we can't guarantee that samples get to here in 24 hours unless we physically carry them, but we can get them to Detroit Lakes uh, overnight, so we've actually had stuff done. Having a certified lab is, is a, a key issue with this. Thanks. Anyway, I just I thought that would be of interest potentially yeah. down the line as you're looking at things. Again, the state understands it's going to have to come up with a bunch of money to get this to happen, and they're looking in the long term. They're looking for partners. Sure. I, I don't anticipate being able to talk my board into opening field offices all across the state, so <laughs> my guys can become roving water quality samplers. But anyway. So that was my rotating basin uh, shtick. The other item, C, 6C, um, I, I listened to last month's meeting on the, the tapes over the internet and heard, you know, discussion or there was an issue with, with the, some contamination adjacent to Ellsworth on the PFAS and PFOA information. Um, 3.30 yesterday afternoon, I got a phone call from a reporter with the Sioux Falls Argus Leader wanting to know what I thought about the lawsuit that the city of Sioux Falls the Airport Commission had filed with regard to their contamination issues around the airport in the city's well field. And I was like, what lawsuit? So he walked me through it real quick, sent me a copy of it. I shared that, given that to Nathan. Um, just, and it was like, oh, hey, get that to me quick. I'll take it with me and pass it off. Just give you guys a heads up. The, the reason the airport's doing it and the city's doing it is the uh, um, city of Sioux Falls gets their water from three sources right now. Um, the biggest one is the Lewis and Clark Regional Water System. It's about two thirds of their water right now is pumped up in a big giant ass pipe from the Vermilion area. Um, they are also currently using uh, a number of shallow uh, wells, a uh, big spur called Big Sioux Aquifer, Stone Creek, Portland. Wells, um, and then they have the ability to tap into the Big Sioux River proper, which they currently aren't doing because that's the most, the least cost efficient way to generate water. It costs more to treat that water than anything else, and they're able to, with Lewis and Clark in the groundwater. Unfortunately, at the airport, which was a huge chunk of their well field, um, I want to say 30% of the wells that got something like that are shut down because of the PFAS and the fallout. Um, and the wells are scattered all around the airport, and well, you know, that's where the, they do the practice stuff and all the rest of that sort of stuff. So they've, they've been closed, none of these, those wells have been closed for a number of years, and they're just simply rerouting water from other parts of the city, and, and thank God for Lewis and Clark uh, right now. But in the interim, they've apparently, again, I just had a chance to read this last night, um, are filing suit against 3M, uh, who were the manufacturers of the raw material that goes into all the firefighting stuff. And then Nathan's got a list of, that there's 20 there's different people named, defendants. and then they've got like another 45 unnamed conspirators, people that we figure will identify once we start discovery. Anybody that sold them anything that didn't say, be apprised if 
you spray this on the ground, it will ruin your well. Um, they're going after it now. Which, again, given the conversation at this board meeting last month, I thought might be of interest. So that was all I really had on it. Um, but yeah, I hadn't heard that. Thanks for sharing. Well, I, yeah, I haven't heard it either, and it hasn't made the paper yet, but uh, I think it was filed. I don't think then the dates on there. I think it's, what, late June? 28th June, 28th June was when it was filed. I haven't, haven't heard anything about it until mm -hmm. the report called. So, anyway, thank you. Thanks for coming. I appreciate yeah. it. Thanks for sharing this. This is good. Mm -hmm. We'll probably need to give it the end of copy. Put it. Hey, that takes care of oh, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Could we ask that or ask that we have a copy of that put in our database? Just sure. Do you want to scan this in? And let it know. Thank you. I'd like, well, to take, I'd, I'd like to take a look at it. Thank you. Here, I think I can, I can forward you. I've got a PDF on here. Okay. I think I've got it with me. Okay. Otherwise, okay. when I get back on Thursday, I can, I can send a PDF. Okay. Good. Thank you. Save having to do the scanning. Thanks. Okay, that leads us to the next item, number seven, Treasury Report. Yeah. Okay, I'll keep it short. Most people have questions. We received about 113000 in property tax levy and a little bit of interest. Our projected revenue from the tax levy is 200000 Funds on hand are about 499000 to date. And the um, admin budget spent is about 44000 and then down here we have the different projects. Uh, one I don't have in here is the septic grant that we voted on last time. However, there's some glitches in that, um, so I, maybe I'll mention that in admin comments. Um, year spent on projects to date is 54000 Quite a bit remaining in the project's budget because we haven't done the pathogen and DNA increase studies. So the bottom line is total expenditures uh, today, they're about 95000 And uh, no questions, I'll go on to the project summary. The bottom line is uh, our unpaid obligations to date for this year, that money that we're going to owe is about 39000 and that includes assuming we pay out that 5000 for that separate grant. Has that not been paid out yet? No. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit later, maybe. Admin comments. Any questions? Do we do a motion for approval on that yet? No. I guess okay. I get a approve. Can I get a motion to approve the, the uh, treasurer's report? Yes. Okay. okay motion is made by Bob. Is there a second? Second. Second by Tom. Discussion? We got a question on the uh, <coughs> Missouri River uh, study. Um, should we? Approaching uh, school lines on having that uh, finaled out here. I mean, we we're, were, were talking about. Yeah, I'll, I can check on that. I thought they were talking about like next month or something like that, September. I thought it was October. October? Yeah, I think October. You got moved back a couple months. But, yeah, you got moved back. I think it was October. Sure. Yeah, I think there were a couple of milestones, and maybe one was an update, the other one was a report. Yeah. I bet Double check. I will take that as an action. I'll check with that. Okay. Anything else? 
Then the motion was second to approve the treasurer's report. All in favor of the motion indicate by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. Motion carried. Thanks, Dan. Item 8, Rapid City Sewer Backup Follow-up Discussion. James. All right. Well, there was a bunch of people at the hearing. Not as many could attend that I would have liked. Um, many with similar stories. Um, their houses were flooded, burned. Um, the engineers were touting, telling everybody to use uh, backup devices, which they admitted don't work. Which I don't know why they're telling everybody run around and go get these flow check devices, which they admitted fail. And in fact, one of my neighbors down the road has his hole in his ceiling where it hit, where it shot out. Um, a couple of things I took away from it. Um, one, the city's talking a lot, but not doing a lot. Um, one of the things that uh, we need to approach DNR and EPA, they're required to report each incident of a sewer backup to EPA and DNR. And from their own documents, they were not doing it. Um, they had specifically left off certain dates uh, when people had multiple claims, they left that off and some of the peoples they didn't have at all um, from their own studies. Uh, they tried to say that everybody was given a claim form, which almost everybody in the audience told them, no, that did not happen. Um, the mayor admitted actually using the city's insurance and his personal insurance, which the city's own ordinance does not allow for. He tried to go back and backstep his words saying, well, his insurance only paid for the damage, but the city's insurance is the one that paid for the pumping. But the city's ordinance is pretty clear. And they've told all us other customers that if we have private insurance that we cannot file a claim with the city. But Mayor Allender admitted to using both himself on a similar claim. One of the things they've been telling their insurance company is that the city's not responsible for any of the sewer damage that was all due to flooding. Uh, during the hearing, they admitted to at least no less than two areas having blocked pipes, which they removed the blockages, broken lines, and manholes below grades. All of those are city fixable issues that have not been done. Um, they even showed a picture of a manhole cover with uh, no, the terms on the top of my head with a riser, but unfortunately they didn't put the right size riser on it. So there's actually a puddle of water over top of a manhole that is not in the road, so they can't say they can't put a taller riser. It's not in the road, it's in a ditch. Well, what do you think happens when it rains and water flows off the road? It goes into the ditch. So they had a manhole cover covered with six to eight eight and from what the neighbors tell me sometimes as much as a foot of water at a time because the city has not put in the proper height riser on the manhole cover so that way it would be above grade. Um, the city's yet to enact any sort of action on this yet. Um, they said they would look at it. Um, Everybody there was pretty upset because the city said, well, we offer this much, but if you take it, you don't get anything else. But unfortunately, nobody there has been offered money, even the ones that were willing to take the city's $3 a foot proposal. No one has been granted that money. So it's still up in the air. I'm still arguing with the insurance company over it because I have all the documents that show it. One of the things they didn't want to admit to, even though we had the sewer maps, is that they have large lines because they even admitted this is a problem with the engineering that they don't want to engineer one neighborhood and then figure out they just put in large lines that flow into another neighborhood, small lines. Well, the reason why they're worried about that, they've already done it in four or five neighborhoods. Some of these are the ones that had the backups. And we've been able to prove that in at least two of them. 
I'm still trying to get the sewer maps to the other three. I know Dan was there and Thomas was there. I don't know how long. Did you stay the whole time, Thomas? I stayed the whole time. I know me and Thomas stayed the whole time. I think Dan left a little early. Yeah, I but I talked to the different people that I hadn't met with. Um, some of them hadn't even filed claims yet. Um, what if I ask you a question, Dan? Yeah, go ahead. Did Lisa Modrick ever get back to you? She seemed like she was wanting to talk to you and trying to solve. So I was just wondering if any of the city officials had reached back out to you after the meeting. Okay. No, in fact, after the meeting, uh, one of the engineers wanted to test my sewer knowledge, wondering why I was so heated about some of the instances of failure I found, not knowing that I was a heavy contractor in Iraq that installed sewer lines. And he asked me some really rudimentary questions, which I aced because a first year plumber's apprentice could have answered them. And then I added the note that, you know, we don't even install eight inch sewer lines in Iraq. Even third world countries know better than install small lines. And the mayor gave him a very stern look. And he didn't have anything to answer to that because he was also in Iraq. And I imagine he was told never to put in eight inch lines over there either. So if we don't put eight inch lines in third world countries, why are we sticking them in Rapid City? Was there any talk at the meeting about a history of, I assume this isn't a brand new development. No, it's not. And what's it? We gave them the history that I've been complaining for 15 years. Another lady in the audience, it's like, heck no, I've been complaining since 97. Then after I went and did some more door to door in my neighborhood, I figured out this neighborhood has had problems since the 70s with sewer backups. In fact, the one couple I talked to built, built the house three doors down from when they previously owned a house because it repeatedly had five sewer backups since they bought it in the 60s, between 60s and 74. They said they had had so many sewer backups, they were done, they were never having a house with a basement again. Um, part of the problem is, and the engineers questions is, well, you know what happens is you have a, a steeper grade sewer line going down, is that that sewer line cleans out faster. But what he didn't want to admit to is what happens when that steep grade sewer line hits a flat trajectory sewer line. Because in this sewer map image, I'll come up to the board and make life easier and talk real loud for the microphone, is that every single one of these sewer lines is an 8 inch line, except for this one. It turns to a 10. But this is all running downhill. And some of these have a, you know, maybe a 15% grade, which is more than enough for sewer. Problem is, is they all come down one road, which is almost a flat trajectory, which is just barely making the quarter inch per foot, which is plumbing minimum code. So they got all this faster moving water, then hits the slow moving section all at the same time. And what do you think happens? It's like a wave hitting the beach. It just stops. So, but we have this nice 10 inch line which then overflows into our 8 inch system. And they're like, well, can you fix this? I said, yeah, you know what I fixed? I called every person on this street here that is on that 10 inch line, not one of their bases flooded. Everyone on this street, this street, and this street with a basement flooded. The difference is they have a 10 inch line and they have storm drains. None of these streets have storm drains, none of them up here, and they're all on one 8 inch system. But just this one section of 10 inch line covers this street, it doesn't make any sense. So that's what we've asked the city to do is upgrade it to 10 inch lines when they do it. I do have a letter from Dan Van Cleve stating that they will be doing sewer and stormwater replacements for our area after October. The only problem is, is every time my sewer is backed up, I've been told, don't worry, we're going to fix it. It'll be done within the year. So this isn't any new promises to me. 
for these people, because like I said, the people that had theirs back up five times between the 60s and 70s, they complained to the city every year. Nothing ever got done about it. That's it. That's all I got. So we're just waiting to see what the city does next, and if the insurance carrier decides to side with the victims. Um, because the one thing I really got mad at is, like I said, when they told them that it was all due to flooding. Even though during their hearing, they admitted to blockages in the line. And I asked the insurance carrier specific, did they admit to any blockages in the line? They said no. They said it was all due to flooding. I said, how would you like to hear the recording of the hearing where they admitted two of these areas had known blockages that they can prove and that other areas have broken pipes, allowing the groundwater just to seep into the sewer line? Okay. Thanks for the update. Okay, that was number eight. Number nine, update on development of Marion Potential State Water Resources Management System, SWARMS Project, Water Quality in Rapid Creek. Mr. Gissel. Well, I guess that's me just, uh, you know, brief little update. A couple of weeks ago, Director Bierke and I had uh, a discussion with a couple of folks from the you know, Rapid City Engineering Department about, you know, possibilities relative to this, recognizing that, you know, the city is kind of a main player, recognizing that, you know, the, the urban influence is, you know, certainly one of the primary influences on water quality in Rapid Creek, and, you know, just trying to initiate a discussion on, you know, what is the potential for partnership there, and, you know, there's some interest There'll be some more discussions coming up. It's, it's clear there'll be no attempt to try to formulate a proposal by this year's deadline of October 1. You know, it just can't happen that soon. And, you know, that's really not a particular surprise. Uh, and certainly the, you know, the information that Mr. Gilbertson brought us here this evening, uh, something to certainly keep an eye on for the future. You know, it certainly could be a mechanism that, uh, you know, could factor into our considerations. It uh, certainly got some intriguing possibilities there. Then, uh, kind of one related aspect, um, you know, some of these discussions have been taking place. Uh, you know, there's another idea that's kind of starting to take shape um, that really kind of came out of this you know, stakeholder session that we had, one of the ideas that was brought to us was really along the lines of anywhere from, uh, you know, habitat improvements along Rapid Creek. This was brought to us by the Penn County Conservation District. A um, few other thoughts brought forth by them, you know, possibilities for basically stormwater mitigation. And, um, you know, it, it's if you look at what goes on in Rapid City, where the new construction is taking place and where it has been taking place in recent years, you know, there have been codes in place. Um, you know, for the most part, stormwater infrastructure, you know, is put in place along with the development, in front of the development. That's the way it uh, works best. You know, 100 years ago, nobody had ever thought about such a thing as having you know, stormwater problems. Uh, somewhere along the line, it kind of started dawning on people that as people built up stream from them, sometimes bad things were happening. <laughs> Too bad that, uh, you know, there wasn't any stormwater detention. So, you know, there are, there's a lot of Rapid City that, uh, you know, is pretty well built out, and, and these are the areas where we have our biggest problems, you know, basically two problems. One is the, you know, the sediment carried by the, the urban runoff sediment and other constituents. Uh, the other one being the basically the the flooding that can occur. I tend to think of it as localized flooding. Um, but uh, been talking some with people here from mines and others. Uh, there's a fair amount of interest, possibility, and in, in perhaps trying to pick places where we could actually, you know, put in some sort of 
you know, stormwater infrastructure, catchments, detention cells, they typically they can't be big ones, but uh, might it be possible to, to build relatively small ones? Um, I um, ride the bike trail with my wife a lot. Uh, we were riding Sunday morning after that big storm Saturday night, and I just happened to notice I'd, I'd never seen it before, but down by the um, swim center, they call it Roosevelt Pond there. Well, that's a big pond that's actually a storm cell, but then just immediately east of it, there's a, a very small one. It's probably less than a half an acre in sight, but it, it catches the, the runoff off the parking lot and, you know, at least a, a big part of, of the swim center there. You don't even notice it there, but uh, very effective. You know, it's full of kind of murky water and, uh, you know, a very effective mechanism and things like that could be put in place. Uh, you know, a good place to start would be things like schools, churches, public buildings, uh, certainly businesses, perhaps there could be incentives given. Uh, you know, basically, concept might be, you know, to try to start high in the basin to where you can help not only with the water quality aspect, but, but the, you know, reducing the storm volume also. Um, the, the logic might be to, to look for where are the places, the, you know, the largest impervious combinations of roofs and parking lots, you know, adjacent to, you know, basically some open areas. Where, where do you have some land there where you could, could uh, put a detention cell? You know, if we go down on Mount Rushmore Road to the Safeway store or something like that, well, it's all roof and pavement. You know, there's nothing to work with. You, you've got to find locations that, uh, you know, where you've got somewhere where you could put a bit of a detention uh, cell. but. Uh, Seems like an intriguing possibility to try to build partnerships that uh, you know, could you know, it'd be fine and well to study Rapid Creek. What more do we need to know, you know, to help uh, improve water quality? But there's a just a vast amount of, of work that could be done, you know, feet on the ground to really make a difference in this. And I'll just point out Heidi Sieverding is is here. She's uh, here with the Civil and Engineering Department at School of Mines. I've had a couple of discussions with her, and Jason Phillips is another name you're probably familiar with. You know, he's been involved with the Green Roof Project and uh, Dr. Kenner. So we've been kind of trading some thoughts on these. This is all pretty formulative, you know, but uh, anything you might want to add, Heidi? City's actually been doing some things, especially all around the creek. Especially along the creek, um, everywhere, every every like couple hundred yards, there's a retention berm for been, stormwater yeah, runoff, but so it can pool we, there, settle before it leaches into the exactly. Stream. They and they, you know, they did a project. Uh, they're going to redo. Uh, they're in the process of redoing Omaha Street, and I don't know if you've noticed, but uh, you know they've they've been doing underground work, and the other thing they've been doing is putting in stormwater retention cells, and. Uh, I don't know if you've been along the bike path there, there's probably four or five of them they put in just uh, right along Omaha there. There's, there's one in the corner of, uh, of Mountain View and Omaha in the south. You know, that was been there for quite a while. And Robbinsdale Park is another one that they, they put in a pretty massive, and, I, and quite honestly with all this wet water, that has really worked. Oh yeah, there. it's a pond. But I, I agree with, with uh, Dan is that like the downtown area, there's, I mean, it's all roofs and pavement and sidewalks. And there's no retention there at all. I mean, it runs off. And uh, that water, uh, 
gets to the creek pretty fast. But, but nobody's going to give up their lot that they're being built for the city it, taxes. It, to it, it takes lot. dollars to do it. And I mean, if that's if there's some kind of pricing that would come forward that we could look at, I mean, I'd be interested in it personally. But could I ahead. could I ask that we have a an update on the retention pond they did put in just to, on the other side of the street from the garage at the Lutheran Church. Mm -hmm. It's oh, a big part. I'd like to have a, you know, have the people that... It's not a pond per se. It treat, it, it, it's, it's, it's a, a slow, under, yeah. it allows for slow percolation Seepage, of yeah. uh, all of the parking lot that is part of the church and the you know, hammer It's a beaching system. There. It's a, a French drain. Right. Well, I, that I know type some, of deal. I know some of the larger cities, for example, uh, Minneapolis, I've been looking at a couple of projects this is a few years ago, yeah. but... Uh, where a business that had to replace their parking lot, and they, the big business, it was like a manufacturing facility, a huge building, and uh, they worked with the city in that particular case, and they put in a huge uh, underground, it was made out of concrete, concrete box culverts basically, to retain all that water that comes off the roof and the parking lots and the sidewalks, and meter it out. Whereas before, it just all just ran off into the receiving stream. And that's that's kind of what you're talking about, some projects like that, right? Well, I was just, could I Go ahead. just finish that? Uh, the thought is that we paid for that uh, development right there. And they did promise, I think, to come back and give us an update on how well it worked or if it didn't work at all or the problems they had. It'd be interesting to have that before we embark on another set of... Well, they, that was part of the... Um, the Black Hills Hydrology Conference. Uh, I went on that tour. I think Nathan went on that tour. I was yeah. on that tour. And you were, and you were on that tour. So you're, what you're saying, asking yeah. for an update on it? Yeah. I think they actually promised that they would do that if we funded their program. <laughs> At least that's the way I understand it. Yeah. Well, we could always add yeah, yeah, we, we could ask. Can, yeah, all we have to do is go back. I don't know how much we put forward to that project or any of the other details. That was kind of after us, but. I don't know how much you spent on that. It wasn't that much. Oh, 10000 I think. 10000 10, I thought it was like ten or 25 Ken Steichen might. Yeah, Ken Steichen oh, would probably be there. Yeah. Maybe, you know, Ken? Yeah, he's at the church there usually. Maybe hey, we could just, just ask him if he'd like be down. interested in coming and giving us an update. Do they still have a website on that? I don't know. We used to have a newsletter. That was it the Trinity Prayer Park or something? Yeah, that's what it is. Yep. That, it was a nice, nice party. Yeah, I had, I had actually people asking me about that uh -huh. uh, just yeah. the other day. Won't hurt to ask, Dave. See, a lot of times they're built, and most people don't know. I don't know if you know this, but all around Rushmore Crossing, on all sides, there's retention berms for all yeah. that runoff, even on the backside. Um, Behind the target, there was a retention berm down there. Right there by McKinsey River. And, and, and don't get me wrong, when the developers do this, they they make the taxpayers pay for it. And I'll tell you why. Because when I build a subdivision, I'll leave like a two acres that I know I'm going to flood out as a retention berm. I'm going to put it in the plans as a retention berm, but I'm going to separate it as a separate tax code, and then I don't pay the taxes on it. And you know what happens? The county has to take that property. Oh my dear, they're going to take my flooded lot, and I don't have to pay property taxes on them more. And then, guess what? Now it's the county's property. And what do they do with a flooded out lot? Can't do anything with it. So, yes, it's really good to say doing this for businesses, but all the businesses I know that do this for a living are already cheating the system eight ways till Friday to do it. Any more of the game? I guess you're still on. Just so, on. Uh, oh. Yes. So with Trinity River Prayer Park, um, we have been observing it in the small lines and we've been working with them to look at some differences. Uh, it is one of the sites that USGS has monitored and water quality data that is available at the site. So if you want to look at information um, that the USGS has 
it's less than replacing the ball. There's little things in every yard that people could be doing if it's of interest. Now, this is something that is taking off. If you go to Fort Collins, you see natural state yards where people take pride in their zero bomb. And it takes people demonstrating and showing how it can be done and it becoming a trend. The new, the new thing is to have a green card. We can make that a trend here. Um, there's alternatives of we reach out to contractors. They can present it as an additional option to homeowners free landscape in the You could be a whole other business with them. It, I think we'll go ahead. Looks like it, uh, it is working to retain water. <laughs> Where is this? That's the prayer part. That's the part. Oh, is that the prayer part? <laughs> After heavy rain. Wow. So I do have a question. Um, <clears throat> I've seen uh, numerous examples of um, projects like this um, that uh, ended up not being good things down the road because of their attraction to homeless people or whatever uh, people's uh, struggle gate there and basically ruin it. Um, I haven't been by there lately. Uh, does it still look nice? Anyway, this park lately? They clean it up repeatedly. They, cl they clean it up very, 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 very a lot. The church does clean it up religiously. Putting out a fire. Is this a 
the website you're on there. Facebook page. Oh, Facebook page. Yeah, the picture of the fire. Look, there you go. There you go. Oh. That was in April, I guess, of last year. So. What are they burning? The weeds. Okay. Probably just getting rid of the plant life. One, one thing about these projects that we're talking about here, the, the, whoever owns them has to have the maintenance budget for them. You can build these things, but if you don't make them, you're going to, you know, you're, like Nancy said, you're going to attract probably the people you don't want in there, and eventually they don't work in tandem. So maintenance is a huge component when you're figuring the cost of these things. Well, it's maintenance and law enforcement sometimes too, just keeping people out from camping there or whatever. And it's a problem along the bike path, as you know. Yeah. Then, boy, it has been. Appreciate some questions. We got more? Well, maybe a couple more comments. Um, you know, certainly there, a lot of your stormwater infrastructure cost way, way out of reach for West Dakota, and especially West Dakota by itself, a lot of it. You know, is the partnership end of it. How can we bring, we need to have other partners, but, uh, you know, on the other side of, of the coin, a lot of these small things wouldn't have to be expensive, you know. You go have a look at that little cell there by the swim center. I had never even noticed it's there. It's, it's small, and, you know, these could go in just about anywhere, you know. I guess I would encourage people to look around in your neighborhoods and, you know, places close to home, where might there be opportunities and, and talk to them. I mean, James in your neighborhood, aren't there a couple of big schools up there? No. Uh, yeah, they, flood, they flood the city. Uh, you they, know, flood, they flood right down the street. Right. You know, look around. Are there, are there open areas where there's the, the possibility to, you know, put in, you know, Something that can slow the water. So I, I don't know. I mean, I'd certainly, to me, it's an area that, uh, you know, this was kind of an example. It's, it's been a number of years ago that that came up and it kind of gone away. But there's a lot that could be done here. And, you know, if, if you can, where are the small, manageable ones? Who are the other partners? If you see possibilities, you know, start talking to people and, Maybe we can try a couple more of these because I think, you know, there really is an opportunity to make a difference here. It, it's a grand idea, but unfortunately you can't put ponds on school property. You'd be having a fatality. You know, you're talking about elementary schools. I don't care how tall you make the fence. If you've never seen a six-year-old climb a six-foot fence and less than I don't have kids, um, it'd be nice, but... The other thing I hear a lot of complaints about is the rain tax. Is what? The rain tax. In the city of Rapid City, uh, whether you have a retention pond or not, you're churning pervious water runoff. Um, yeah, there's a drainage fee. The drainage fee. Yeah. Yeah. Whether you're really draining any water or not, even in homes. With well, here's, here's the thought on that is, I mean, I, I live on top of a hill. Do I have a drainage problem? I don't. But my roof and my side, my, oh, my, my, my sidewalk is running off, and it's the person on the bottom of the hill that has the problem. I believe I'm the guy on the bottom. And you're on the bottom of the hill. Uh, even though I'm, in, I'm, I'm pretty high up, I just happen to be the one of the lower guys in the high ups. So it's. I mean that's. Yeah, we'd love. I, to, I still pay a drainage fee. There's, there's nobody money. that's going to give up their house to build a retention pond in that neighborhood because it's fully developed. And in all the new developments, it's a requirement to have the drainage in there right. already. Yeah. Well, part of that money is, is for maintenance. I mean, they the city has only had a drainage fee for a very short period of time, sure. and, and spending no money whatsoever on. Maintaining these ditches and stuff, they go through. Right, yeah, they weren't cleaning them. No, they had, they they had, had the financial resources to do a part of the reason to have the drainage space. So, anyway, we, we can talk about that all night, I guess. I don't know. Is that? She, she has one more question. Oh, I got another Go ahead. Drainage. Is there anything that would prevent
Yeah. Thanks, Let's see how it's other moving. Yeah. Yeah. And we the south of the what is that? Our That's our C shirts. Yeah. And it's gone down to thirty two dollars since uh, last year when we we uh, paid up. It's for uh, liability and crime insurance, so each, yeah, I'd like to make a motion that we approve the town. Is there a second? Second. Okay, motion's made and second now for discussion. So what exactly does this insure us uh, for? Our general liability insurance. General liability. And personal property insurance. What so are we so liable for? If uh, we are sued in court, we have to go. Dan, well, it's, there's a few things, and I'm not the expert. We went through this last year, we could hear, uh, Mr. Driscoll, that uh, there's crime insurance so protects the water development district from a director, say, embezzling money. That would be one thing that would be covered by it. Uh, it acts, you know, somebody, say, we went to here for a conference and we were driving with, uh, on that business and we hit somebody it would <clears throat> actually your insurance would kick in first but this would be like a backup to that so there, there's two examples it was very mild curiosity okay. <laughs> probably, probably something we just sort of needed uh, director Williams and I talked to, to uh, yeah, like the last year about it quite a bit. I remember it made sense at the time, but I don't remember all the details. Let's say one director punches with another director, that will also be covered. Probably not. I agree. No, it would be covered. You might be one of you might go have a criminal proceeding, but the other one's medical bills would be covered. Let's not go there. Any more discussion? Thanks. Motion's on the floor for it's not dreamy. Yeah, yeah it's it's it. <laughs> All in favor of the motion indicate by saying aye. 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 All the same signs. Motion carried. All right. I'm I guess my name's on there. I, I have a question, Director. I yes. should have mentioned this earlier. Can we do 12 before 11? One would stand to reason the levy comes before the budget because the levy would be part of the overall budget. Anybody opposed to that? Well, we did it Saturday. Yeah. Huh? We did approve it. And, uh, okay. I guess we'll oh, we have to go back and actually change the budget once we approve the levy. You, you understand where I'm getting? No, I, I get where you're going. I'm just saying that. Let's just uh, go over the budget here. I, I do have one thought. Uh, you know, we had quite a bit of discussion about the couples on the budget. At our last meeting, uh, we were talking about a project scene, but, but, and then along with that, we did this uh, item with, uh, what do we call that? Uh, non project assistance. Pro project assistance. We have $150,000 in there, and we have $140,000 for the uh, contingencies. And what I was wondering is if, if that's really what we meant. It just seems to me uh, we've got a lot of those two items. Is it, is it necessary? So my thought was maybe we ought to leave the project contingency at 40000 which is what we had last. 
and just have $150,000 under, under the project assistance uh, item. So you're saying leave the contingency? What I think it was supposed to say is non. Uh, what, what would be unallocated projects? Well, we funds not project. allocated for projects or something of that nature. I, th I think that's what we agreed on. We have to call them that project system one hundred fifty thousand. No, I think we changed that. It's supposed to be like. I, I guess my point is that. I don't think we need to have $140,000 on this project, contingency project fund. That's my suggestion would be to leave it at $40,000 and then so reduce that by $100,000 and then leave the project assistance fund item as $150,000. And we basically reduce our budget by $100,000. Any, any thoughts on that? Well, we have, we have two possible projects uh, will use up 290,000. Uh, I'm sorry, I got this noise maker here. Sorry. Um, in your minutes from last time on 16, motion to change. I think that could have changed. <laughs> yeah, it did get seconded and carried, though. Um, I think at the end, just jump in. We voted on this spreadsheet, but that's my recollection. All right. I'm just not looking at it. I think to me, like, we, I mean, we've got $362,000 for the budget, and we don't really have any. I mean, this water quality thing is it? We don't know for sure whether we're going to move forward on that. I'd like to see it. Yeah, we don't know if we're actually going to have to do anything with an attorney to assist me and a hundred other folks, which I hate to think we have to, but yeah, I don't know. And I know there's a lot of very frustrated individuals. Well, that's, that's my two cents worth. Are you making a motion for that? I was just trying to get a little feedback. It has the, the I thought we had it as, it as non-allocated project funds. I motion that we uh, reduce the uh, contingency project fund by 100000 Is there a second to it? Second. Second by Bobby. Any discussion on that? I would agree, based on the terminology that we're using there, project which suggests to me that that's a, a pool of money that we might add off of if there was some kind of overage or addition to a continuing versus a holding pot for some new project. So right. I would agree with the motion. <clears throat> and I would amend that motion to, I agree with removing the 100000 from the contingency project and just in adding it to the project funds line. Where there's 150, it should be 250. I ask you more to amend it. Yes. Amendment to the motion. Is there a second to it? So it would decrease, as agreed, uh, contingency project fund and just add it to. Dan, can you? Uh, Sorry, yeah, minimize your screen just temporarily, please. Sure. The project assistance line instead of being 150 would be 250 and that would be good for all projects away and we would not be changing the proposed budget numbers at all and we'd still have a large surplus in the bank okay is there a second to that no. uh, maybe i could suggest rather than motion and motion maybe we see if we can sense this and then settle on a motion you know i'm not necessarily a, opposed to such a thing you know a question i would have my impression i guess correct me if i'm wrong dan am um this is a non-binding budget so it would come up that we would want to put take funding out of basically the reserves that can be done at any time correct correct so this is kind of a straw yeah. Yeah. It just so. has to get printed to the state, and 
the one thing I would suggest is if that we're going to ask taxpayers for that they have a kind of idea of where that money is supposed to go. So if it's going to go towards projects, why don't we just tell them it's going to go towards pro projects yet, but it's going to go towards projects. I think I understood your motion for a minute. Well, we don't have a, is there a second? I'll second for discussion. For okay. Motion we'll second. Bob Gibbs. Bob Gibbs. So we got a motion and a second for the amendment to change the uh, project contingency policy and put the hundred thousand in the project assistance line item. So, so it'd be two hundred fifty thousand there. It would do what you do. Yeah, just, yeah. yeah I know, but I don't assistance. know why we need so much. I don't know why we need a quarter of a million dollars hanging around in a uh, that line item alone is where annual revenues would be. <coughs> I, I tend to agree with what you're saying. I, I don't think we, and I, I agree if we need, if we run into a project that comes up and we need extra money, we can, we can go to our reserve if we need to. Where is this money that we are going to take out going to go then, Nathan? What's that? We're taking the 100000 from here. The category is it going to be held? Is it just it's going to be $250,000 instead of 150000 where it just says project, project assistance. Right. That's the way you understand it? That's what the bylaw is motion is. Yeah, that's what the motion is. My motion. motion. Okay, if I can, there, there was a motion to reduce this by 100000 and then substitute to do that plus add the 100000 Yes. And that gives us, in other words, the total budget of 455820 doesn't change. And that was the second one, second by Director Cole. Yes. We do have a requirement from the public to say something. And I, I apologize because you're obviously talking about it when I was outside. Because it was just the Contingency project fund. Contingency for what? If it's over. So if okay. So if a if, if an already identified project, for instance, septic assistance for well, <laughs> but anyway, uh, the Canyon Lake sediment study. You, you budgeted eleven four twenty nine. If you, if there are cost overruns. And want to inject more money, that would come out of that pool yes. as opposed to the project in this pool down at the bottom. Yes. Okay. Any other discussion? Anybody? One example of that this year, we gave out $5,000. That was, well, we might, that was not budgeted for septic assistance. That was not budgeted for 2019, so that that happens in the contingency budget. If, if I could, and just ask it quick, particularly given the discussion, if, if that's the case, I mean, the, the procedures for allocating money out of the project's pool, which may or may not go from 150 to 250, is that really any difference than the, the project contingency fund? In other words, if, if all of that, and again, I'm not necessarily Nathan, I, I get your point there, but do you need a separate pool of extra? You've identified unobligated, what I would call unobligated project assistance fund, 150 on the sheet, whatever that number is going to be. If you needed more money for USGS screen gauges, because what you budgeted at 15.6 is not enough, it would, I think I'd say, fine, that just, that comes out of project assistance. That's where it came from in the first place, rather than rather lock out 140 or even 40 that otherwise would be unavailable to the board. Somebody may come in, you know, sometime in April with the best thing ever. 
I think they always left a 40,000 contingency in case the entire budget was up right. during the fiscal year, that there was a, something to lean back onto for... And, and that, could be, I mean, it's, it's, no, that, that could be your capital reserves to identify the whole thing. I'm just... So I we, we have a surplus right now, but yeah. right now it's a flow of surplus. Go ahead, Nathan. I, I would agree with Mr. Gilbertson's uh, comments. I I don't know why we even need to have these uh, line items here. I mean, if we just have gated funds, we can identify uh, projects as we go. Um, I think what we're trying to do is justify a budget. Um, but if you look at the bottom line, <coughs> That budget number that we're showing there is about two times our revenue is. Um, it's kind of uh, indicating uh, some level of your responsibility, in my opinion. Um, I, I think we'd be better served just to simply leave it unobligated and then, like Mr. Gilbert just did, if somebody comes in with a good project idea that we can evaluate it, we don't have to worry about what line item it comes out of or whatever, we just take on obligated funds and go for it. So, <clears throat> we don't have to play accounting games. I guess I, I agree with that line of thinking too. Whatever name we put on it, whether it's contingency or unobligated, we just have one and have all that extra money there to well, use as, as needed, if needed. We have the thing you know, that we're going to spend money on. We've got the line items for those, and then whatever remains is just unobligated funds, and we just keep it simple. Okay. Well, part of the reason for the budget is to let the public know what we're yeah. going to do. So, in, in my opinion, if there's a fair chance we might do something, I want to see a problem. How about if we call it unobligated project dollars or something? I don't really no. care. I mean, it's just... I think that's kind of what it is. Or this, last year there was no such thing as everything was defined, and then the contingency was the unobligated stuff. Well, well, we had a lot of discussions, obviously, and that's what we heard. Well, as, as a group, as a board, so, agreed, but you call it that, I guess it's just... That's what you want to call it. Get rid of everything except contingency and project. These two are. Uh, no, we have to keep up there that we know we're going to spend money yeah. on. It's just. Yeah, okay. Fair enough. Yeah. I mean, the contingency fund, I don't have a problem with that if we want to have one side for a contingency. But, you know, beyond that, I don't, I don't know why we have to parse out whatever our unobligated funds are. And we have the discretion to spend it however we deem fit, and we can do that at any time so that we need to have a placeholder there at all. So if we get both of those categories and put it under unobligated project assistance, or some just so that we can say that it's unobligated. It's funds that are available. Yeah. yeah. I have to agree with that. It's just simple. And so we would be But is that gonna be a motion? Right now we change the name. Right now I'll retract my motion. Original motion. And who is Bob you saw? Yeah. I'm with Mason on this. And then uh, yeah, I'll retract my amendment. And then, you start then we need a new motion. For yeah. I'll make the gated project. Could I ask is what we're talking about? Can you put it back up there? Sure. Let me just get a note here so I don't get this open for big stuff. Is what we're talking about combining the lines that are numbered 27 and 37 into a yeah. category? Yes, right. Yeah, unobligated un un project funds. I'll make that motion. Okay. I'll second that motion. Motion by James, seconded by Now, any discussion of that motion? Well, we've got to have a dollar amount, correct? Yeah, just a dollar. Oh, yeah. Just, just whatever the total of unobligated funds are remaining. Whatever is remaining of what? And actually, 
you could whatever we carry over could potentially be lumped in there too. I mean, we just have a big obligated. Are you talking about including our reserve amount? Yeah, whatever we simplify. Yeah, it's middle. in the it's in the budget. Budget. What do you have? Because we don't have a specific reserve category, so that would be unobligated funds. So, I'm trying to educate myself. What, what dollar amount? I mean, just to add up to 362. Is that what you're saying? You would, for this, for next year's budget, it should be whatever the balance is between what we expect to bring in and all of the Whatever's expenses left. that we've got. So. And whatever remains would go into that unobligated project fund. So our, our, our question we keep, for example, uh, tree planting, or is that, are you saying get rid of that obligated? That's not the same with this one. Yeah, stream gauge is probably the same as obligated, but we generally well, we do have a proposed for for those other ones for 2020. We didn't put a dollar amount in. I think those are those for are proposed. being negotiated individually. Yeah, yeah. but proposed at this point because it looks like we only got two lines. Of well, one you line in. What you've got there, you have the, the Yes Canyon Lake sediment that would stay there. Um, that's, that's not obligated, though. That hasn't been signed. Yeah, 26,000. Yeah. I thought we uh, opened it. No, we didn't. No, no, we postponed it. Postponed until September. 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 Yeah. Okay. Hey. I apologize. So I, it gets back to making the, the thing tiny. Yeah, you know, they yes, are. Yeah, are hey, 
In your budget, in your, in our version of this, our version of this page, yeah. we have basically two lines. What are they? The line would be, uh, again, looking ahead to the coming year, okay, committed project funds. So we already right, have that's one. The line. Committed project. Those are dollars the board has already agreed to provide to USGS for gauging stations. We, we, we will make that decision in federal fiscal year 2020. That's a 2019 decision. We're not going to get the bill from Joyce until next August. That's money that is already, so that has to show up in any other item. But you, do you have an agreement with them for next year? Yeah. Put, put it in your I budget. mean, we, we, it's in you know, one year and the payoff for the next year. But I, I say our committed project funds are those projects where the board has formally said we are going to give this or this activity a certain amount of money. Now. We don't, all, we don't necessarily have a, a timeline on those things. Some of them may be the, the commitment of $10,000 over three years. Well, that may get parsed out. They may, that may be used slowly, but each year, some of that obligation is going to carry over. That's committed money. That's money we got in the bank. But it's not available because it's actually committed. I, we formally promised that money to Robert. And you've got an agreement. We can't with, spend it. You have an agreement. Have an agreement. With, okay. Have an agreement. Then the other line is, uh, as I just go and said, is the unobligated project assistance. And, and when I prepare the budget, it is basically this is the income I. These are all the sort of line item administrative costs and everything else. And when all those things are accounted, whatever the difference between the income for the year. And the expenditures is unobligated project assistance, and I, I think that that would make your your chart here way simpler. And frankly, for somebody again, whether it's you know the core and, the, and even the district tree planning, you know you may go, yeah, we're going to do that next year, and it's up to Dan and the rest of the board to not spend all the money because <laughs> you missed that. But putting it up on the board says, no, you're going to get it. You may, if, if, if you change your mind, I'm the I'm kind of pissed because you guys even published this in the newspaper that we were going to get that money. Right. That's not really. That's not what you intended to do. So, and it would make again. That's a. It could be a two-line activity. You know. Yeah. You may. You may be right, Jay. I had done this one right. before. That's I right. Should yeah. copy them from the year before. Yep. Just I get that. I, 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 I don't want to. I, I get your point. Yeah, well, we've been doing it. See, I've been on the board for two years, and I said, this is the way we've been doing it. But, I mean, it doesn't mean you can't sum up. It's simplified. Right. Yeah. The next year. Yeah, I think that reflects more the reality of what we are you know, really about. We've got the budget that Dan's got here. On the, we've got $93,220 that we need to have for various kinds of administrative expenses are in 211 something. So the difference between 211 something and 93, 220 is our unobligated project for the year 2020. It doesn't reflect the money that we haven't spent over the past number of years that's sitting there in the bank that we could draw upon. But it echoes the reality of what's going on in the 2020 budget. And it would be directly associated with our um, with our income that we project for 2020. So I think that's the way we maybe should modify going forward. Okay. So, so, so I had a question, Jay. So on what we call appropriations at the top, these are also basically just estimates. Right. So I mean, they're, they're estimates based on, again, yeah, I did it for a couple of years or whatever. But so you go through and say, you have, and I, I work in your budget, I mean, it's, you have director expenses, you're projecting $11,300. Okay, fine, that's a line. Admin, $19,500. Professional, $32,420. Contingency, which is the admin, but that's the, the contingency of $10,000. Um, and I don't off the top of my head know what that number is, but um, that those are the identified expenses that you project having for 20 so you think this is okay up here? 
Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, so the lines there, that's what you expect, you know, membership and all the rest of that sort of, those are sort of the thing that you know are there. Um, then the only other thing, and a difference in ours to this one would be, okay, what prior commitments do you anticipate carrying over into 2020? So committed projects and time committed projects. Committed projects, projects. so <laughs> that would have to go in there. And then there you go. That's that's what you have to have for next year. Now your committed the committed expenditures, that, that money's already in the bank. So you've got an income category that matches that. Really income, but it's money that's already there. Um, and so essentially, yeah. Whatever you don't spend on director expenses, admin purposes, or that contingency is essentially whatever's left over is unobligated project assistance. Now, if you only use the thousand dollars of interest in two eleven four twenty one projected, you're not going to be very much project assistance available for next year. That is then. Then you say, okay, well, we like to have a hundred thousand available. So you pull the balance of whatever you haven't spent from the actual income in 2020 out of reserves to fill the gap. So when you do your state budget and your reserves on there right now? No. Okay. No, and, and in fact, I, I, we used to do kind of what what the two of you were kind of getting at. With I used to think, well, yeah, whatever money we had left had got plowed back into project assistance. As we started to accumulate reserves after wiping ourselves out, that number got to be pretty big. And my concern, frankly, was keep it calm. Was somebody from going crazy and spending it all, and then we're back to nothing. I talked to the folks at the legislative audit, and they said, no, budget is what you expect to get next year, what you expect to spend next year. The rest of it is cash reserves, and those cash don't always have to be there. They're there if somebody asks you to tell them. But, so, yeah, you've got an under even this thing piece together, you know, even with the transfer of $243,399 of money from Keen, you still had two twenty-eight three eighty-five in reserve that doesn't show up on the budget anywhere at all. And, and that would be available, there it is in the green, if something really went wrong or, again, somebody came in with the world's greatest project. Oh, my God. For one of $100,000, we could cure cancer. Well, hey, guess what? We got two hundred twenty-eight three eighty-five in the bank. We're the board. We can spend what we want to. At the same time, you know, Dan here sees you know a real bargain on gumball machines and convinces the board to buy everyone, one for everybody in the district. That you, you don't want that money right at your fingertips, sort of thing. So. All right, I would like to. Cancel my motion and make a substitute motion. That under project expense, what we have is committed funds and the non allocated funds. Two lines. Now the dollar amount is going to be what then? I don't think we have any. Well, we, have, we have nothing for committed, so we can leave it off this year. One option, excuse me, I lost it. Insert all of that prior committed stuff. And again, that 
ends up showing up both on the income side and the expenditure side. Right. You know, here's what we still have. That's in the bank. It's an income. We have the expenditure authority, and the numbers have to be identical. And so, yeah, it's a question. At this point, unless there, you know for a fact that there is some particular project that will not ask for every penny that you've committed to them, your committed project fund projection for 2020 could reasonably be in but conservative will be looked at as being zero. Uh, uh, I was wondering, I, I'm sort of lost at this point. Uh, yeah, I'm getting we lost. have specific motions on the table. He just made a motion, but nobody seconded it. So the motion would be, Dan. Um, so you went through this motion. Yep. So that under where it says projects now, unless we have a project admitted to, we don't put it down. And then we have unobligated funds and committed funds. We don't have any committed funds. So we can put the line in and still put it. I understand that. that. But what, and I, then the I rest, really the rest of our budget that. after the administration cost would be unobligated funds. It doesn't mean where it's going. It doesn't mean who's getting it. I understand. It's just that. the leftover from that budget. Yeah, I understand that. And nothing from our reserves. So that's what I like this dollar amount is that it's going to go under. The it'll numbers. it'll be just whatever it's next year. Well, the, the levy would based on what that dollar amount is. That's why we should have done the levy first. So Eleven, whatever. That's the right. That's, 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 that's the levy right there. Okay. So okay. This will all be built in. Continue this. So it would be the levy minus our administration costs. That's what I was wondering. So unobligated funds would be approximately $1,217,000. Just a question before we get too deep into motion. You know, having published this budget, if we kind of want to stay close to that for this year and then revise our preserve for the next year. I'm open to wherever the board wants to go. We've got plenty of confusion, but if no, because then we wanted to stay, you know, kind of similar we showed in the newspaper, we could, you know. Well, then, like you what, said, what we've done isn't really wrong. If you know, your rec calls up and say, "Where's my twenty-five?" Wait, okay, Ron, what's your input? My thought is that uh, again, um, based on the wisdom of uh, our uh, director over here, our executive director. We have a budget line item uh, for 2020 proposed to cover the administrative expense 93 to 20. Yeah. So if we were to kind of go along with what this uh, idea was that we published already, we could reduce the unobligated project funds then to something like you know 150 thousand dollars. So we'd have those two line items, which would be similar to what we've got here, but but not exactly. But we'd just be going over what the, uh, you put us in the negative. And if you tell people we want it's a negative, they're going to come in here and march in the pitch first. Well, the, the actual balance of our income versus our expenses is 118201 If I did my quick calculation, yeah. I have 19 because he's got $1,000 of interest on $1,000 of interest. I forgot that. There. Yeah, so in, in the, apologies for the East Dakota version, yeah, you'd be, as Ron said, the, the, all the other expenses that have been, have been identified on the 9020. Yep. Yep. Your proposed levy and the and interest is 212. When, that would leave 119.201 as unobligated. Is that that's in below interest? Interest? Yeah. Okay, so is there, is there a way to increase? That we spend only what we take in. Yeah. Well, that would be, I mean, would be that scenario. Now, I will tell you in our case, our expenses exceed or are, are closer to our total tax limit. And so, in order to have what my board feels is a reasonable amount of money available for these permit come in. 
we will we will draw from reserves as necessary to ramp that number up right now. But uh, yeah, no, I, I, without without I, I, without I, I, tap, without tapping the reserves, it would it would look like yeah you would still have just under one hundred twenty thousand available to award for new projects in twenty twenty without having to go any of the reserves that you have, which would always be available if something came along. If you wanted to have more, you'd move 30,000 out of reserves. Now that number goes up by 30,000. For, for demonstration, should I zero these out and then just put that number in? Yeah, let's just see what it looks yeah. like. Because <clears throat> that reflects our income expenses based yeah, on yeah. Uh, for, for 2020. Have anything really committed? Yeah. And uh, the not 119 or whatever it is isn't that far away from where we're going. I'll just put it on the other one. What was that number again? 119 201. And the $1,000 is that the banking interest? Yes. All right. So that would be our budget for 2020. How's that look to everybody? That's pretty close. Yep. So. We could leave those lines in there, but we haven't actually committed any money to there. So, you know, if we wanted to look at, have it look similar from a final based on the publication. But there wouldn't be any really need to because project is just, because well, project contingency true. would go away. Yeah. We have, we have to send this to Wendy Sandler, the Department of Revenue. Yeah. I, I assume the only Yeah, I would I would I wouldn't leave those expenditure numbers. They would have to come off. Yeah, just eliminate all those lines. Okay, so for for the so you're saying yeah. all the way over and delete. And then project assistance should be